Okay, so my name is Jesse. I'm a graduate student uh, working with Eric Lander and Mitch Gutman at the Broad Institute. And I'm going to tell you a story today about a different, uh, uh, a different part of the non-coding genome, which are the no large non-coding RNAs, which form a, another layer of regulatory control in cells. And over the last few years, our lab and many others have begin, begun to catalog the diverse functions of link RNAs. And we found that many are involved in controlling uh, maintenance of, of pluripotency in stem cells or controlling cellular differentiation or even in causing human, uh, human disease. And uh, an emerging paradigm for how link RNAs actually accomplish this uh, diverse array of functions is that they act at the level of chromatin. In particular, many link RNAs have been demonstrated to interact with chromatin regulatory complexes and to regulate specific gene expression programs. And together, these two observations suggest that link RNAs might actually localize to specific regulatory targets across the genome and perhaps play a direct role in recruiting chromatin regulatory complexes to regulate these sites. And if this were true, link RNAs might actually represent a, a critical missing component of our understanding of genome regulation. And so to test this hypothesis, uh, what we, we want to answer two questions, which is, where do link RNAs localize in the genome, and how do they find these regulatory targets? And so to answer this question, what we really need is a biochemical technique to map the localization of link RNAs across the genome, similar to ChIP-seq for localization of proteins. And so we sat down and, and plotted out what this might look like, and conceptually it's very similar to CHIP. We'll cross-link cells to fix endogenous link RNA chromatin interactions, we'll lyse the cells and break up the genomic DNA, and we'll capture these complexes by incubating the lysate with probes that are antisense to the target RNA that have biotin attached to them so we can purify these complexes with streptavidin, sequence the associated DNA, and figure out where the link RNAs bind. So, uh, on paper, it sounds very simple, and Eric told me, this is your rotation project for two months. Um, <laughs> but in reality, it was very challenging. It took a few years to get it right. Um, and I'll just point out uh, that we named this uh, protocol RNA antisense purification because we're using these antisense probes. And it turns out the probes were actually the critical piece of this, uh, of this protocol. Because you can see that if you choose any particular location on this link RNA to, to position your probe, it might be blocked by a protein binding site or some secondary structure. And so instead, uh, we just tile probes across the entire sequence so that we can be sure to capture any accessible part of the link RNA. And furthermore, we made the, the probes very long, 120 nucleotides, so that we can ensure very specific capture of, of our target link RNA. So how does this actually work? So we decided to test it on a classical link RNA called EXIST, which has been studied for 20 years, actually, because it orchestrates X chromosome inactivation in females. And EXIST uh, is encoded on the X chromosome and actually coats one of the X chromosomes and silences gene expression across the entire chromosome to form this repressive nuclear compartment in the nucleus that's marked by fish. And so we designed probes that tile across the entire EXIST sequence, capture the complex, and sequence the associated DNA. And when we do that, we find that 70% of the reads map back to the X chromosome, compared to just 5% in the input and control. And of course, we already knew exist localized to the X chromosome, but the power of doing this by high throughput sequencing is that we can figure out uh, where exactly on the X chromosome binds. We can zoom in on this cloud. So what I'm showing you here is across the entire 167 megabases of the X chromosome, the exist locus is marked here. Uh, and the enrichment of uh, DNA sequencing reads in the EXIST purification versus the control is on the y-axis. And the first thing that we notice is that, in fact, EXIST seemed to bind everywhere. It's more than fivefold enriched across the entire X chromosome. And when we looked at higher resolution, this seemed to be true everywhere. So uh, EXIST does not bind to specific motifs, but rather binds broadly across the whole chromosome. But at the same time, you can see that there's variation in the precise level of enrichment across the chromosome, and so we wondered what that represented. And so we first looked at a few of the uh, highly enriched exist regions, and it turns out that these regions are also enriched for the K27 trimethylation histone mark. Uh, and in fact, K27 correlates with exist occupancy across the entire chromosome. And this made a lot of sense because exist actually is known to, to interact with the polycomb repressive complex 2, which actually writes this uh, histone modification. And so it made a lot of sense to us that these would correlate. So next we looked at some of the regions of the chromosome that have particularly low uh, enrichment for exist RNA. And we found that these regions almost invariably contain genes that are known to escape X chromosome inactivation. 
In other words, the genes that are expressed from both the active and the inactive X, even in differentiated cells. And in some cases, you can see like a very sharp boundary between the escape gene in blue and the silence gene in black. So now we were pretty confident that RAP was actually giving us the endogenous localization of a link RNA. And we'd like to turn to our next question, which is how does EXIST actually locate its regulatory targets in the first place during the developmental stage where, it's, where it is activated and spreads to form this nuclear compartment? And so to answer this question, uh, we used a inducible male mouse ES cell line, which was developed by our fantastic collaborators at UCLA, Catherine and Amy. And in ES cells, and particularly in male ES cells, EXIST is not expressed but we replace the endogenous promoter with a TET-inducible one so that we can add doxycycline to the media, activate exist RNA expression, and watch it as it spreads across the chromosome. So what this looks like by fish is that before you activate exist, you don't see it. After one hour of activation, it appears as this spot. And after three hours of activation, it begins to spread out across the chromosome and form its distinctive compartment. And when we look at this at high resolution with RAP, we can see that there's very little enrichment across the X chromosome at zero hours. At one hour, it appears as this large peak at around the uh, exist locus itself. And by three hours, it's obvious that it's spreading across the chromosome. And so now with this data, we can answer this question of how exist locates its regulatory targets, and in particular, where exist goes first. And there are a couple theories that have been proposed to explain this phenomenon. And one is that EXIST spreads linearly out from its transcription locus and just marches from nucleosome to nucleosome until it covers the entire X chromosome. And another model is that EXIST somehow jumps and hops to distant sites um, uh, that are identified by some special feature. And if we uh, look at our beginning data, we can you know, predict that maybe it will follow one of these models. And in fact, you can see if you look across the entire X chromosome that there are specific sites across the chromosome that have particularly high enrichment suggesting that it in fact exists as somehow jumping or leaping to these distant sites. So the next question is, what are these sites and how does EXIST identify them? So one possibility is that these sites have particularly high affinity for the EXIST RNA. Perhaps there's a specific motif there or some uh, RNA binding protein sitting in this region of the genome. And so we searched computationally for such features and we were unable to find any in part because these peaks seem to represent large megabase size regions of the, uh, of the chromosome where exist binds broadly across. And so we turn to an alternative possibility that uh, because chromosomes ado adopt three-dimensional um, conformations in the, in the nucleus, perhaps um, these sites aren't explained by high affinity for exist RNA, but rather by uh, close proximity in three dimensions to the exist locus. And so what we need to do to test this is compare the initial enrichment of EXIST, the initial localization pattern of EXIST, to the uh, three-dimensional chromosome conformation before we activate the uh, EXIST RNA. And so we compared our data to uh, high c data generated by Bing Ren's group in mouse ES cells, and we found that indeed the sites that have high initial localization for the EXIST RNA are also the sites that most frequently contact the EXIST uh, locus in three dimensions. And of course, this correlation doesn't imply causation, and so what we really need to do to establish this link um, that's, and suggest that, in fact, the chromosome conformation is guiding EXIST is that we have to somehow change the local chromosome architecture of the EXIST, exist locus and see that the RNA expression follows this new pattern. And so what we did to do this is we moved the EXIST gene somewhere else on the X chromosome, 50 megabases away, and you can see that in blue here, this location on the X chromosome has a very different high C uh, profile of contacts across the X chromosome. And indeed, when we express the RNA from this new location, it follows this almost perfectly. And so uh, we tried this a few more times. We put exist on a different chromosome altogether, and, it, and we saw the same thing. And so uh, what it suggests is that um, the way that exist is initially spreading is that the the X chromosome adopts a particular conformation in an individual cell. And that when you activate exist expression during early development, exist simply reaches out in three dimensions and spreads to things that are nearby. But what happens next? That's, that was our question. And, and uh, in particular, we know that chromosome conformation varies between individual cells. And so how would this mechanism explain how uh, uh, exist can reliably access the entire chromosome in every cell. 
And so we thought about this and realized that because uh, exist actually recruits uh, this chromatin modifier and changes histone uh, modifications, that perhaps exist is actively changing structure as it spreads to sort of ratchet in the X chromosome and pull new domains of the X chromosome into closer proximity. Um, so the prediction is that if we interfere with this ability of exist to modify chromosome architecture, that it will not be able to reliably spread across the entire chromosome. So to test this, we took advantage of a mutant form of exist. Um, the A repeat domain has been shown to interact with PRC2 and necessary for silence unit expression. So if you delete it, exist can no longer silence gene expression. And it, I don't have time to show you all the data, but in cartoon form, what happens is that um, if you express exist, it still forms this nuclear compartment containing all of the non-expressed regions of the chromosome. But chromosomal domains containing many active genes loop out into the nucleoplasm and are not properly silenced. And only when you have the ability to silence gene expression can you silence these genes and ratchet in this chromosomal loop into, the, into this repressed domain. And so we think that exist is spreading through an iterative process. First, it reaches out in three dimensions, spreads to nearby sites. It changes chromosome conformation and pulls new regions of the chromosome into closer proximity. And after that, it repeats this process by spreading in three dimensions to newly accessible sites. And so in the last few minutes, I'd like to suggest that these, in fact, uh, these principles that we've learned here, in fact, apply to other link RNAs and perhaps represent a generalizable strategy by which link RNAs identify their regulatory targets. And so we've learned two things here. Um, one is that the ability of exist to spread in three dimensions is taking advantage of a unique property of link RNA. And that is, as opposed to an mRNA, which has to be exported into the cytoplasm and translated in order to be functional, a link RNA is functional upon transcription. And so it can actually use its unique position in the genome to achieve regulatory specificity for nearby sites in, th in three dimensions, and might explain why link RNAs with even low expression might reliably find their genomic targets. And the second lesson we've learned from EXIST is that link RNAs might play an active role in changing chromosome architecture and establishing nuclear compartments that contain the co-regulated targets of link, link RNA complexes. So uh, the RAP method that I've described is generalizable and can be applied to many different link RNAs. And so we've begun to do this for many of the dozens of link RNAs and ES cells that are implicated in chromatin regulation. And I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of those that demonstrate these principles. So one is another link RNA that forms a small cloud. This is smaller than the exist cloud. And when you look at this uh, localization of this link RNA by RAP, it coats this ab about 500 KB region that includes uh, the, uh, its, its locus here, but also coats three additional genes shown in, in green that work in the same biological pathway. And a second example, uh, this uh, link RNA is encoded on the X chromosome and um, in females appears as two spots marking the two X chromosomes. Uh, this link RNA actually reaches out in trans and contacts sites on other chromosomes to regulate the expression of these four genes that are involved in energy metabolism. So uh, I think that I've shown you that three-dimensional genome architecture is an important uh, strategy by which link RNAs localize to their regulatory targets. Um, and I'd just like to finally point out that the RAP method uh, is not specific to DNA, but actually can be used to figure out the, protein uh, the proteins that are in complex with link RNAs or even other RNA species that might work in concert with link RNAs to control and regulate specific gene expression programs. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the team that made this possible. Uh, my mentors at the Broad Institute, Eric Lander and Mitch Gutman, um, our fantastic collaborators at UCLA, Catherine and her postdoc, Amy, and then finally, the entire team, uh, who, uh, the link RNA team at the Broad Institute, whose um, help on this project has been invaluable. And thank you all for your attention. I'll take any questions.